and I will be your conference operator today. At this time, I'd like to welcome everyone to the Victoria's Secret & Company's fourth quarter 2023 earnings conference call. Please be advised that today's conference is being recorded. All parties will remain in a listen-only mode until the question and answer session of today's call. I would now like to turn the call over to Mr. Kevin Wink, Vice President of External Financial Reporting and Investor Relations at Victoria's Secret & Company. Kevin, you may begin. Thanks, Ryan. Good morning, and welcome to Victoria's Secret & Company's fourth quarter earnings conference call for the period ending February 3, 2024. As a matter of formality, I would like to remind you that any forward-looking statements we may make today are subject to our safe harbor statements found in our SEC filings and in our press releases. Joining me on the call today is CEO Martin Waters and CFO Tim Johnson. We are available today for up to 45 minutes to answer any questions. Certain results we discuss on the call today are adjusted results and exclude the impact of certain items described in our press release and our SEC filings. Reconciliations of these and other non-GAAP measures to the most comparable GAAP measures are included in our press release, our SEC filings, and the investor presentation posted on the investor section of our website. Thanks, and now I'll turn the call over to Martin. Thanks, Kevin, and good morning, everyone. I want to first share my appreciation and gratitude for the hard work and dedication of our associates and partners around the world who executed our strategies, delighted our customers, and delivered solid financial results in the all-important holiday quarter. <clears throat> I'm pleased to report that fourth quarter adjusted operating income and EPS came in at the high end of our guidance. Sales in the quarter were up 3% compared to last year and were at the midpoint of our guidance. Our fourth quarter gross margin rate increased significantly compared to last year, exceeding our expectations driven by disciplined inventory management and cost reductions related to our Transform the Foundation initiative to modernize our supply chain. Sales trends during the quarter were volatile by week, but we were encouraged by the improving quarterly sales trend in North America, driven by a sequential improvement in traffic and average unit retail in both our stores and digital channels, with traffic in our stores increasing in the fourth quarter as compared to last year. We were particularly pleased with our early holiday sales in November and during the peak days and weekends leading up to Christmas, both in stores and through our digital channels, led by strong response to our giftable merchandise assortment, improving customer experiences and marketing messages. The team strategically managed promotional activities to amplify key moments through the days and weeks leading up to Christmas. And we entered the semi-annual sale period with lower inventory levels than last year, which allowed us to maximize margins during the sale period and enter the spring season with healthy inventories. Our international business continued its strong performance with system-wide retail sales up more than 20% in the fourth quarter compared to last year, driven by significant growth in China and globally with our franchise and travel retail partners. We continue to experience profitable growth across stores and digital, and we're excited about our aggressive growth plans to expand our footprint in both stores and digital around the world. From a market perspective, sales for the intimate market in North America as a whole decreased mid-single digits in the quarter compared to last year, which was the fourth consecutive quarterly year-over-year -year decline. We remain the leader in market share for the intimates category, including both bras and panties. Our share in the intimates category remains at about 20%, with our digital share up slightly and our store share down slightly. We were encouraged by our market share gain in digital increase in both bras and panties. From a merchandise category perspective, starting with Victoria's Secret, our beauty business continued to be our best performing category, with year-over-year -year growth for the second consecutive quarter and was followed by performance in casual sleepwear, panties, and bras. Within pink, sleepwear outperformed intimates and apparel. We continued to roll out our reimagined pink apparel merchandising assortment in the fourth quarter. The sales trend improved, and while still down to, compared to last year, we continued to buy the category cautiously. The impact of the pink apparel challenges in the fourth quarter was approximately one to two points compared to last year. 
Over the last 90 days, we've executed several key actions in support of our strategy and brand positioning for the long term. For example, we continue to, de- to further develop our understanding of our Victoria's Secret and Pink customer through our multi-tender loyalty program, which now has more than 26 million members who drive more than 75% of our sales on a weekly basis. Through insights and data, we're focused on turning our understanding of her into world-class, world-class customer experiences. In February, we relaunched our number one bra collection, Body by Victoria, with all new styles and our latest innovation. The popularity for online bras continues to increase, and our newest invisible lift technology offers lightweight design that smooths, shapes, and supports without an ounce of padding. In February, we also released our pink apparel spring campaign, Going Places, featuring Natalia Bryant with the new pink styles and comfy fits. As part of our commitment to expand our categories, we debuted swim products under our new swim collaboration label, Pink by Frankie's Bikinis, which celebrates the iconic pink brand reimagined through the lens of founder and creative director of Frankie's Bikinis, Francesca Aiello. From a technology perspective, we entered a multi-year partnership with Google Cloud to embark on BS and Co's AI journey to focus on improving customer experience online and on our mobile apps, improving the associated experience and improving operational efficiency across the enterprise. As we expanded our store of the future fleet to 83 stores or approximately 10% of the fleet in North America and continue to expand our footprint internationally. From a liquidity and capital allocation perspective, we ended the year with a strong balance sheet and ample liquidity to execute our strategic plans. We generated significant cash flow in the fourth quarter and ended the year with a cash balance of $270 million and debt down over $150 million year over year. Additionally, our board has approved a new share repurchase program authorizing the repurchase of up to $250 million of the company's common stock. As we look into the new year, we recognize the broader intimates market in North America has been down for four consecutive quarters, and the macro environment remains challenging, putting pressure on the consumer. As such, we are planning the business conservatively in the near term and maintaining open to buy to capitalize on any changes in trend. At the same time, we remain focused on delivering on multiple initiatives to drive growth in our business over the longer term. For fiscal 2024, our forecast assumes the broader intimates market in North America will remain pressured throughout the first and second quarters, with sales trends improving through the back half of 2024 as we continue to roll out growth strategies and new customer experiences. For the 52-week fiscal year 2024, we're forecasting sales to be about $6 billion or down low single digits to a comparative 52 weeks from fiscal 2023. At this level of sales, we expect adjusted operating income for the year to be about $250 to $275 million. For the first quarter of 2024, we're forecasting sales to decrease in the mid-single digit range compared to sales of $1.407 billion in the first quarter of 2023. This forecast reflects our expectation that the domestic intimates market will remain challenged and that our core customer will be cautious in this environment. These challenges will be partially offset by the continued strength in our international business. At this level of sales, we're forecasting first quarter adjusted operating income to be in the range of 10 to $35 million. The team continues to manage inventories with discipline and we expect to end the first quarter with inventory levels in our core Victoria's Secret and Pink businesses down mid single digits compared to last year. At our investor day in October 23, we discussed the opportunity to drive operating margin expansion through our initiatives to transform the foundation of the company by modernizing the operating model. We remain on track and committed to a total of $250 million three-year goal that we established at our investor day in October 2022. We realized about $90 million of savings in 2023 and expect to realize approximately $120 million of savings in 2024, primarily in gross margin. Lastly, lastly, as we have shared consistently inside and outside the business, 
With the long-term health of the business in mind, we remain committed to our strategic priorities. Firstly, to accelerate the core, second, to ignite growth, and thirdly, to transform the foundation. As we look into the new year, we are committed to our initiatives designed to leverage our market leadership position and unlock the opportunity to convert our significant cultural influence into long-term financial growth. We believe our evolving strategies will position our business to deliver the potential of our category-defining brands, and we remain confident and are committed to delivering long-term financial targets and returning value to shareholders. Thank you. That concludes our prepared remarks, and at this time, we'd be more than happy to take whatever questions you might have. Thank you very much. We will now begin the question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question, please press star 1. Your name is required to introduce your question. To withdraw your request, you may press star 2. Our first question now is from Alex Straiton with Morgan Stanley, and your line is open, ma'am. Great. Thanks a lot for taking the question. Just on the, the full year revenue guidance, it looks like there's an acceleration embedded after the first quarter despite compares getting harder. So can you just talk about what enables that acceleration? It sounds like it's particularly uh, back half weighted. And then I just have one quick follow-up. Yeah, thanks for the question, Alex. So when we thought about the full year um, in relationship to first quarter and the trends that we've been seeing in the business, <clears throat> you know, we, we made some assumptions around kind of where the domestic market share might go or the, the intimates market domestically might go. So as Martin mentioned in his prepared comments, the market for intimates has been down uh, four quarters in a row now. Um, as we look at the beginning parts of, 20, of Q1 and 2024, um, it appears to us it's going to continue to be a challenge. Um, we've assumed in our guidance that the domestic market for intimates will continue to be, get, to be down through the spring season and will start to stabilize, not grow, but stabilize as we move into the back half of the year. So we've tried to align our forecast with that. We've tried to align our inventory and cost structure with that uh, in mind. Additionally, as we move through the year, we recognize that many of the merchandising strategies that were articulated at the Investor Day in October uh, will be in full flight as we move into the fall season. So things like category adjacencies that Greg spoke to, um, the relaunch of sport, which Greg spoke to uh, at the Investor Day. So those um, high-level merchandising initiatives that will put out different products <clears throat> and present differently in the store really are in full flight in the back half of the year. So the combination of uh, an assumption around the stabilizing intimates market and newness in category and presentation and expansion of category, particularly as it relates to intimates and bras and sport, um, are part of our assumptions uh, for an improving trend ever so slightly quarter to quarter as we move throughout the year. So down mid singles, um, down low singles for the year, um, you kind of get to flat the down low singles, the balance of year. Great, that, that's super helpful. And maybe just one quick follow-up, just with the, the headlines recently on the, the credit card late fee uh, proposal and a ruling going through, have you contemplated that in the guidance or how should we think about uh, what that means for Victoria's? Thanks a lot. Yeah, good question. Um, obviously, that's very topical at the moment, but it's not a new topic. It's been out there for several months and several quarters. Um, but does seem to be picking up a little bit of momentum lately. Um, first, I think it's important to understand that you know we do not necessarily recognize any revenue on some of the fees that are being discussed or debated, um, but certainly our provider does, and that impacts their model. So um, we've got a long-standing relationship with our partner. We'll continue to try to work with them, but I think it's important to understand that um, some of the fees that are being discussed do not directly go into our P&L. It's uh, certainly something that our, our partner relationship will need to work on, though. Thanks I think lot. additionally, um, Alex, you might recall, or, or others might recall, too, you know, the, the launch of the non-tender or multi-tender loyalty program in the middle part of last year obviously was a big, big move for the company and a big opportunity to communicate and incent customers differently than maybe in the past. So, 
we do have a couple of different ways to be working with our customers to um, incent traffic and encourage them to continue to shop in our stores, not just one dimension like in years gone by. Great, thanks a lot. Yep. Thank you. Our next question now is from Ike Borachow with Wells Fargo. And sir, your line is open. Hey guys, uh, good morning. Uh, two questions for me, um, maybe both for, for TJ. Just on, on the guidance, um, <clears throat> can you talk to us about the flow through on the lower sales outlook? Um, I think when, you know, when we look at the guidance, it's about low single digits, 3% below street for revenue for next fiscal year, but it's 20-25% you know, below on EBIT. Um, how should we think about that? Are there things you can look at in the cost structure? Um, it just seems like a lot of lost EBIT on, on not as – you know, not that much lost revenue, honestly. And then the second follow-up is just on the share buyback. Um, how, opportuni uh, how opportunistic do you plan to be um, with that as you kind of look out for the rest of the year? Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the question, Ike. Um, in terms of the full year guide, you know, it's difficult for me to speak to what others might have in the model. So I'll speak to how we're thinking about it and how it compares back to the investor day in October. So. Uh, back in October, we talked to you about a number of things that needed to happen in our business in order for the operating margin to expand and the flow through um, to be you know, significant to operating income. We talked about North America sales needed to improve and needed to move into the low single digit range. Um, that has not happened yet. We're not forecasting that to happen in the current year. Um, so that's a bit of a headwind. We talked about the international business needed to continue to grow and it would become a larger part of our business. Uh, growth in the mid-teens or higher. Um, clearly, we just came across the fourth quarter in 2023 where that was the case, so I'll put a check mark next to that for a job well done by the team. We said that Adormi needed to continue to grow both in sales and profitability. Um, they were relatively close to their targets for 2023, and we have plans for growth in 2024, um, so we feel good about that element of the model. We said the gross margin rate would go up, would increase, um, both based on sales, but also based on some of the cost work that we're doing around cost of goods sold. Um, you started to see that come through in the fourth quarter, and that's embedded in our first quarter guide. So that is working as intended. The expense rate, we said needed, we needed about a 1% to 2% increase in sales to leverage on expenses. Um, that's not our current forecast for the year. However, our internal plans that we review on a regular basis with the board, we're comfortable that our expenses are, are in line and would be leveraging if sales were up 1% to 2%. We also said that our um, debt to EBITDA or our leverage ratio would, should be two times or less, and we just came across the year where that is, is true as well. So um, the single biggest uh, challenge in the model right now is the North America sales trend and that's what would be driving you know, the majority of the flow through that, that you're challenging. So I'm confident that the gross margin, um, when I look at estimates, actually our gross margin uh, rate was likely above the street um, for the year, even on the lower sales. Um, when we look at expense rate and leverage opportunities, you know, in any given quarter, Ike, um, you know, we're talking about expense dollars that are up minimally year over year, it really comes back to the North American sales element. Even in the first quarter that we just guided to, when you start to work through the model, I think you're gonna find that we're talking about expense dollars maybe being up 10 to $15 million year over year. Um, and as a business that continues to invest in technology and continues to want to um, you know, provide for a good uh, a good wage and, and merit, et cetera. Um, I think those numbers are probably uh, pretty minimal relative to what you might see elsewhere. So I feel good that expenses are well under control. It really comes back to the top line movement that we need to see in North America. The second part of your question around share repurchase, uh, I think we mentioned in our prepared comments that <clears throat> there is no assumption for share repurchase activity in our guidance for 2024. So uh, we worked with our board of directors and we aligned on a share repurchase authorization, um, candidly based on feedback from shareholders that uh, they wanted to know and feel confident that we could be in the market at, at any given time. Um, but at this time, we're not uh, providing a forecast on how we might go into the market 
or when. We're very focused on making sure that we're um, trying to increment the trend of the business, uh, stabilize and improve the profitability in a down intimates market. Um, we're very focused on making sure that uh, we've got sufficient liquidity to execute our strategies, and, and when we know that we do, um, based on our, our forecast. So, um, you know, future decisions on capital allocation and share repurchase will be you know, made in concert with the board on on a quarterly basis. Hope that helps. Yep, it does. Thanks. Thank you both. Our next question now is from Simeon Siegel with BMO Capital Markets, and sir, your line is open. Thanks. Hey, everyone. Good morning. Um, Martin, how are you thinking about marketing this year? Just, I guess last year you had Tour and Mariah. I assume some big investments that we're going to be lapping. So any learnings on those spends, how you're planning marketing this year? And then just maybe a little higher level, just recognizing the industry's top line pressures are what they are. And then, TJ, the point you just made about despite operating profit guide down, the gross margin is showing improvement. Any changes in how you're thinking about the value of promotions and maybe balancing a focus on revenue versus profits? Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Simeon. Uh, good questions. Uh, to start with the marketing, we plan to invest marketing dollars at about the same percentage of sales that we did in 2023, so continue to invest in the brand. Um, essentially, that's across the five areas that we talked about at our investor day. So firstly, in terms of customer, really deeply understanding the customer, segmenting the customer file, building data and personalizing. So more and more of our spend is going through personalized marketing, uh, particularly through social media, but all through, through curated um, online experiences through the app and on site. Uh, continued investment in our brand, focusing on relevance and brand heat, uh, positioning around powerful confident, sexy on her terms, and then supporting product launches. You know, our broader category appeal beyond intimates, getting back into sport, all of those initiatives will be supported with marketing dollars. And trying to find ways to go to market that are at the intersection of brand and product and entertainment. Uh, and to some extent, the World Tour was a sort of a tiptoe back into that uh, last year. You know, as we, as we hindsight it, I would say we got enormous media coverage, like 17 billion media impressions that were, you know, in excess of 80% positive. So that was good. Um, we were part of the narrative about popular culture, and that was certainly our intent. And it gave us some good assets that we could use in the fourth quarter marketing. So, you know, to a, a large extent, it um, met our objectives. However, I think about the way that we went to market during the fourth quarter as more of a sequence World Tour was the start of it. We then had the My Wings, My Way campaign, which was extremely successful and uh, very popular. And then that led into My Mariah Carey, which was our best received of all of um, the work that we did last year. So as I think forward to what will be the next iteration of our flagship marketing events, I think it will be less fashion and more commercial. It will be less ethereal and more fun. It will be more of our own product and less of other people's products. And it will be more focused on holiday commercial and building commercial sales into the all-important uh, time of year. So, you know, I always try to look forward, Simeon, rather than to look backwards. We're excited about what we've got coming forward. Um, the World Tour is a bold and progressive ex expression of our brand, and it, it gives us a, a basis from which to build and continue to, uh, to, to move forward. As it relates to your second question on promotions, our level of promotionality in the fourth quarter was slightly up relative to prior year. Um, we still, as TJ talked about, were able to maintain healthy gross margins, but we did feel the need in a down market in a very competitive environment to lean into promotionality. The first quarter of this year looks about the same with promotions up slightly. We, on a day-to-day -day basis, are balancing the art of offering newness at full price with being aggressive in our core categories. And I will tell you that it's, uh, it's, it's very much the balance of art and science, and it's different by category. In some areas where it's more difficult for us to defend share, like panties, um, which is a less, less differentiated merchandise category, we will need to be aggressive, and you will see us leaning into uh, promotions as aggressively as we ever have. 
in other areas where we've got true differentiation and added value, it's less uh, of a requirement. So it's, that's the skill of what we do, Simeon, and we manage it very carefully on a day-to-day -day basis, and I'm very proud of the team that are doing that work. Thank you for your question. Next question, Fran. Thanks, guys. Jonah Kim with TD Cowan. Ma'am, your line's open. Thank you for taking my question. Just curious what you've saw, seen in terms of consumer behavior quarter day in terms of traffic and conversion, and then also if you can talk about key drivers behind international strength and what gives you confidence that momentum will continue throughout the year. Thank you. Yeah, on uh, consumer behavior, I would say nothing particularly meaningfully different year over year. We did see spikes in traffic, so traffic to stores came back at certain peak weeks, and that put pressure on our selling organization to be ready. Um, we did see an increase in browsing traffic, so conversion was down in stores and some peak times. We saw that um, our digital business performed slightly better in the quarter than our stores business. We actually picked up some share in digital. That's partly due to us being more efficient with our marketing dollars, partly due to the enhanced digital experiences that we're seeing. So honestly, I think it's more about us than it is about the consumer behavior. Um, so I would say you know, n nothing particularly meaningful. As we look across the different uh, cohorts of customers, behaviors were broadly similar at the, um, at the higher end of the income bracket uh, as they were at the lower end of the income bracket. As it relates to international, uh, the headline is really about China, where our partnership with Regina Miracle continues to go from strength to strength. Um, working closely with that team on digital experiences, direct-to-consumer experiences that are working extremely well. Um, I think we're marketing the brand very well in China, and we still have a, a lot of growth still to come. Across the franchise network, we saw health all around the globe. We're very pleased with our partner operations, uh, getting a store model that enables us to expand. We're going to open 70 to 90 stores this year, so a smaller footprint. Um, with a lower capital expense that enables us to get to more customers more quickly, and also embracing digital um, in the international space, be it operated by us or operated by our partners, a combination of both. Um, all of those factors are driving growth. We also see some opportunity in new markets in Scandinavia, Benelux, Balkans, uh, again, both in digital and in stores. So all across the system, and I didn't mention travel retail, I should mention strength in travel retail as well. So. All across the system, we see opportunity to continue to uh, grow that business. Um, so well done to the international team. Thank you for the question. Thank you. Our next question now is from Dana Telsey with the Telsey Group. And ma'am, your line is open. Hi, good morning, everyone. Martin, can you expand on the store of the future, how it's looking to you, and any tweaks since you first introduced it? And on the pink apparel, the path to improvement there and how you're thinking about directional change along with the marketing message with the Victoria's Secret Collective and how that's progressing and how you're utilizing that tool. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Dana. Um, let's go to Pink first, and then I might ask TJ to comment on the retail, on the um, store of the future uh, question. So in, in Pink, you know, we, we identified um, more, I don't know, about 15 months ago that the pink business was under significant pressure. We didn't like the customer that we had developed in the pink business. We needed to get back to pink being an on-ramp for Victoria and very clearly targeting a younger consumer, a collegiate age consumer. So we set about rebuilding the brand, uh, the identity of the brand, the categories that we operate in, the way that we go to market, everything about the brand. And because it was such a big rebuild, we decided to buy very, very conservatively and not swing for the fences. And what we found um, during the, the fourth quarter was we had an increase in the number of customers that came into Pink, so that was good. Our brand equity improved markedly during the quarter, uh, and the perceived worth of the brand was up a touch as well. What we didn't see was awareness, top of mind awareness. We have lost top of mind awareness with that young consumer. How do we get it back? Well, it, it all comes down to the product, as you know, and so leading with intimates, being strong in bodysuits, being strong in innerwear, um, 
having uh, a really strong and compelling gift assortment, a strong sleepwear assortment. All of those things were positives in the brand. The area that we found toughest is apparel, and I mean sort of outer-based apparel. Um, so we continue to lean into that. We continue to find new ways to go to market. We're particularly pleased with the Going Places campaign with Natalia Bryant. That looks like um, that it's very positive for us. So the, the drag has a pink has reduced, but we still have work to do. Um, we're taking it steadily and buying uh, cautiously and giving ourselves opportunity to chase. We have, we're in a better open-to-buy position right now than we've been at any time in the last three or four years. So we're almost completely open to buy for fall, um, which we've not been in that position for a while. So, you know, really giving ourselves the opportunity to test and learn and then buy aggressively into the things that, that are working. TJ, do you want to take the store of the future comment? Yeah, absolutely. So, Dana, we continue to be very encouraged by store of the future results, um, both in this new class of stores from 2023 as well as the class of stores that was it, uh, executed in 2022, which are now in their second year. So uh, the stores that have been you know, uh, remodeled the longest uh, continue to see double-digit sales increases, so that's a, a very strong performance, very good due for us. Uh, the stores that have most recently been renovated uh, are more likely in the, the mid to high single digits and growing. Uh, again, same narrative as what we experienced in, in the 2022 stores. Uh, they start out at one level and they continue to build, particularly through traffic over time. So we're very happy with with the remodels and renovations. You know, what's changed or what's different? Uh, candidly, we, we've tested and gotten comfortable um, that we can do a, a, I'll say, a less disruptive uh, remodel, meaning kind of utilizing or better utilizing uh, some of the uh, walls and fixtures that were in place. Um, so there's less construction that needs to happen, so it's a less disruptive process at a lower cost. Um, that's something that we've learned, and obviously um, we, we like the lower cost element of it uh, at the same productivity, so that's a good do. I think another big win as it relates to Store of the Future is our, our opportunity to consolidate stores, and what I mean by that is bring a freestanding pink store uh, together with a freestanding VS store and have a combined location. Um, as the pink uh, business has been challenged, obviously that challenge is freestanding stores. Um, and additionally, it just gives our team, Becky and her team, an opportunity to really you know, leverage uh, and be more productive with the teams we have in place. So bringing stores together, we're seeing footage go down 20 or 30 percent and sales maintain. So sales per square foot are much, much higher. And then the last point that I'll mention, uh, and just underline from Martin's comments on international, Getting to a store of the future format that is smaller square footage, um, easier to navigate, um, and easier to shop uh, has really opened up uh, the doors in a big way to expanding and increasing the number of new stores we're adding on an international basis. So it's a lower cost due for our partners and, and ever as productive. So um, a lot of key learnings. Um, you know, I think as I think about new stores uh, in the store of the future format, um, we've had uh, very good success to date in off-mall, particularly in outlet centers. Um, so as we work to decrease our mall exposure in certain locations or in certain markets where, where malls might be consolidating, um, we're finding off-mall, particularly outlet center with the new store of the future format is a very, very good do for us. So um, a lot of good learnings and, and very encouraging results continue in store of the future. Thanks. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Our next question now is from Matthew Boss with J.P. Morgan, and your line is open. Great, thanks. Um, so Martin, m maybe on current initiatives, could you speak to initial customer response to the recent Body by Victoria bra launch? And just larger picture, um, if any way to elaborate on customer trends that you saw in February and early March. And then just for TJ, what supports your view for back half improvement in the intimates category? Or what have you embedded for the promotional outlook in the first versus second half of the year? Great. Thanks, Matt. Thanks for the, for the question. Yeah, um, the Body by Victoria launch uh, was our biggest and most successful bra launch in five years. So we talked previously about Love Cloud being a very 
big initiative for us. The BBV launch was even bigger and even better. Invisible lift technology meets endless comfort and very much on trend in terms of lighter, thinner memory pads. Plus, we had innovation in the online segment of our bra category. We also had a minimizer bra in that um, assortment, which is very innovative and has proved to be very successful and with relatively low level of marketing customers finding it. Within BBB, we have expanded sizes and expanded skin tone coverage. And we've also seen success with the new shimmy, shimmer panty that supported that launch. So kind of all across the franchise, we've seen strength and we're very pleased with the performance of it. To your point about trends, it definitely supports trends for uh, lighter, uh, more comfort bras. So we feel very pleased with that overall. The challenge that we have is that while that bra launch has been very successful overall, we haven't been able to lift the overall bra business. Um, So finding a way to unlock great launches and at the same time maintaining the level of sale across the rest of the bra franchises where we're really, really focused. Um, To your broader question about consumer trends, I think as we look at, say, the Valentine's Day period, what we would observe there is that we had more success with casual, flirty, um, comfort-driven merchandise than we did with the sort of traditionally overt more sophisticated, um, overtly sexy and provocative merchandise. Whether that's a long-term permanent trend or just a short-term remains to be seen. We feel appropriately covered on both of those dimensions. As we talked about before, an important thing for the Victoria's brand is that we don't just show up as one way of being sexy, that we're sexy on her terms. And that means that we embrace all aspects of a woman's journey through life and, and provide better comfort and sport bras than anybody else in the market. So that's how I would respond to the customer trends. TJ? Yeah, I think additionally, Matt, your question on February and and early March, um, you know, in in the first quarter, what, you know, the basis for our guidance was really based on early uh, results here in the first five weeks of the quarter. And what we really saw was um, characteristics that were very similar to the fourth quarter, you know, put aside the extra week for a moment, but characteristics that were very similar to the fourth quarter on the top line, but we were getting there a little bit differently. So in the fourth quarter where traffic in our stores and mall traffic um, was, was much better than earlier in the year um, and, and conversion was, was a little bit lighter, we move into first quarter and, and really mall traffic and our store traffic is more challenged than it's down to last year and conversion is is relatively flat. So it's producing a similar outcome on the top line. Um, Certain of the key metrics are behaving a little bit differently here in the early part of Q1 relative to holiday. Holiday is just a a much different uh, proposition for us and for our customers. Uh, The second part or maybe third part of your question around assumption on, on go forward you know, we, we did make an assumption that the intimates market would continue to be difficult in spring. Um, we made an assumption that it would stabilize, not improve, but stabilize as we move into fall. Um, so that's a market assumption inside the box in terms of what we're doing differently to try to get a different outcome. As we mentioned in, in earlier remarks, some of the, the, the new merchandising strategies that that Greg spoke to at the investor day uh, will be more in full flight in the fall season. And that includes sport, that includes sport bras. Um, as we've talked about on a number of occasions, you know, the, the market um, is growing in sport and we're underpenetrated. Um, the market for sport as it relates to overall bras is in the range of about 30% and it's not 30% in our stores. So as we move towards um, a a similar market representation of product and go after the sport business, uh, we think that ought to help in the intimates category as well. And that's, uh, again, newness in the back half of the year. So um, there are things we're doing that hopefully change the trend um, in the intimates performance, and we are assuming at some point a stabilization, and we picked fall um, for that stabilization in our guidance assumptions. So. Um, you know, when you work through the overall model, what you kind of get from a top line perspective, you got down mid singles here in the first quarter and you've got down low singles for the year. So it's not as if uh, we have a significant 
um, hockey stick, uh, but we are assuming some level of stabilization in the back half of the year. Great color. Best of luck. Thanks. Thank you. Now, our next question is from Marnie Shapiro with Retail Tracker, and your line is open, ma'am. Hey, everybody. Um, you know, just touching on this whole sales notion, because it sounds like the goal here for 24 is to drive sales. Martin, could you touch on a little bit some of the new products like Fun and Flirty, like Wink, like Body by Victoria? I know they're newer this year, but are they driving traffic to the stores and are they driving sales? Um, and it, it sounds a little bit like even as some of the new stuff is selling, it's not driving the rest of the store. Do we hear that right? And then I noticed in a couple of stores that you have a dormy in the Victoria's Secret stores. Could you talk a little bit about the strategy there as well? Uh, hi, Mar Marnie. Thank you hi. for the for the question, and thank you for noticing the newness that there is in store. You know, when our brand is at our best, we have abundant newness. We have newness across every category. That's what drives the business. And so over the last few years, we've been putting in place an innovation pipeline to get back to having multiple bra launches per year. BBV bra launch was probably the most important because it's our biggest bra franchise and it was overdue an overhaul. All of our bra franchises need an overhaul. You know, we have to be continually renewing and refreshing. And the good news is, and, and you hinted at it, that when we do that, the customer notices. So BBV, biggest and best launch we've had in over five years. The Wink bra customers notice. Um, it, you know, immediate impact. The pink seamless air, notice. The featherweight max sports bra, notice. So, yes, the customer finds the new product and appreciates the new product, and our store's feedback channel tells us straight away when she sees it. Um, the challenge is we've got to get more people into the franchise overall. So that means more relevant marketing. It means targeting our spend to get new people into the file. And the good news for us is one of the key ways that we have to do that is the loyalty program. Our loyalty program is now up to 26 million people, over 26 million people. That enables us to be much more surgical in the way that we target so that we can point the appropriate products at the appropriate people. Um, and that means um, just you know, a, a more structured marketing investment, a more targeted marketing investment. So I think there's significant reasons to be cheerful that when we develop the new products that you've referenced and others, mm -hmm. and we have lots more in the pipeline, that we can market them to the right audience uh, in an effective way. Um, you have a real eagle eye for spotting what's going on in stores because we have a dormy in just five stores <laughs> out of 850. <laughs> so you're, you're, Sorry. you spotted it. We have about three cabinets um, in those stores. As the owner of the Adormi brand, and we're very, very proud to be the owner of that brand, it's important that we test every aspect of how the consumer responds to the brand. You know, the brand is in growth. It grew in the fourth quarter. It grew in the, in the full year. It's well positioned for 2024. They're in peak marketing uh, right now, building their file for the, for the balance of year, both across Adormi and Daily Look. And Adormi continues to expand into new channels of distribution through wholesale and license and so on. Um, and they're doing, you know, really, really cool work. I don't know if you saw their fashion show, um, yeah. which was a great success, embracing inclusivity and diversity. It was the only fashion show event at New York Fashion Week that had shoppable online content. So, you know, doing some really cool stuff supported by Gen AI in that brand. Being part of our stores business is not the main thing at all. That is a okay. digital business. But as the owner of the business, it makes sense that we test every, uh, every possible way in which our customer will interact with it. So don't expect to see an enormous amount more of a dormy in stores, but do expect us to continue to mine for opportunity to work that brand as hard as we possibly can and to embrace it as part of our, our family of brands going forward. Great. And can I ask one more follow-up on bras? It, it, there's a bra trend bubbling up that you know bras are actually coming back in style. Push-up bras are actually coming back in style, not the way they were you know, back in the day. But what could this mean for your brand? because it, it feels like if this trend continues to bubble up, it could be pretty significant for you guys, because bras have been out of style for a couple of years now. Yeah, I mean, it, look, if you think about what the different trends of bras have been over the years, the one that we would like to come back the, the, the most and the strongest <laughs> would be the push-up bra, because we dominate that part of the market. Our share in push-up is significantly higher than it is in online or in sport or in any other aspect of bras. So, yes, that would be great. 
I don't see that as a structural change right now in the data that I'm looking at, but from your lips to God's ears, that if that is a trend, <laughs> we'll be very, very well positioned to take advantage of it, Marnie. Okay, great. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Our next question now is from Warren Chang with Evercore ISI. Sir, your line is open. Hey, good morning. Uh, I was wondering if you guys can walk us through the shaping of the gross margin through through the year a little bit uh, in a little more detail. It sounds like leverage picks up a little bit in the second half. Uh, I think you said promotions will be higher in the first quarter. I know there's some moving pieces with cost savings, but maybe if you can, if you can contextualize for us the drivers this year and any call-outs on shaping. Yeah, <clears throat> Warren, this is TJ. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll do my best there. So I think at a, at a very high level, um, you know, we would expect the margin rate to be up for the year, largely driven by the cost of goods uh, sold initiatives that we have in place as part of Transform the Foundation. Additionally, here in the early part of the year, we continue to see um, favorability from a transportation standpoint. So transportation rates that are embedded in our inventory are lower year over year, so that's a, a net positive. Um, on the flip side, as Martin mentioned, um, we are seeing slightly more promotional activity here in the front part of the year. So those are the, I'll say the key elements <clears throat> from a margin perspective. And then the last one would be, you know, B&O deleverage, which is really going to going to follow sales. So if you think about how we just talked about the sales trend or what the embedded sales trend is for the year, um, I would expect us to have cost of goods sold initiative benefit throughout the majority of the year, especially the first three quarters. When we get to the fourth quarter, we start the anniversary of what just happened in this most recent fourth quarter. So. Um, it's more more present in the first three quarters of the year. The transportation opportunity we still think is available to us in first quarter and potentially second. Uh, we don't necessarily have uh, a crystal ball on where transportation rates will go in the back half of the year. So that benefit likely impacts spring in a positive way. From a promotional standpoint, um, Martin mentioned we, we do expect to be a little more promotional than last year here in the first quarter. Um, as we move through the year, if our assumptions are correct and the intimates market stabilizes, hopefully that promotional need abates a little bit. Um, and then as I mentioned, B&O will, will track where sales are going and what sales trends look like. So down mid single digits here in the first quarter down low single for the year or, or slightly better as we move through Q2, 3, and 4. So that's kind of how I would think about the key drivers. Um, I do think there's an opportunity for the margin rate just in total, obviously, to be up in the first quarter um, and potentially up in the second and third. We had a very strong gross margin performance in the fourth quarter that we just came across. Um, so I think you know anniversary and that might be a little bit more challenging, but uh, we'll, we'll see what we can do when we get there. So I um, feel very good about the gross margin opportunity, again, on lower sales uh, based on how the teams are managing um, inventories in our stores and in our distribution centers. Thanks. And I just also just wanted to clarify, clarify an earlier comment on the impact of the CFPB ruling. It sounds like you're saying the late fees don't flow directly into the P&L I wanted to clarify whether they flow indirectly, or are you saying it's just not an input to your credit sharing arrangement? It's it's not an input to our P&L. Um, that's something that is between our our provider and 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 the customer. Thanks. Good luck. Yep. Great. Thanks, Warren. Fran, I think we have time for one more question. Then our final today is from Mauricio Cerna with UBS, and your line is open. Greg, good morning. Thank, thanks for taking my, my question. Um, just wanted to ask about, uh, you know, the operating margin outlook. Maybe you could help us reconcile on the SGNA. Like as, as you were mentioning earlier in the call, I think you you know, called out, you know, first quarter. It seems that SGNA dollars are up like 10, 15 million dollars uh, year over year in Q1, which is roughly like two to three percent. Just wondering if that should be like the run rate we should assume for the rest of the year, you know, excluding the, the impact of the additional week, you know, on, on Q4. Just wanted to get more sense. And, like, is that increase, like, what kind of, like, where is that coming from? Is it technology, marketing? What would be, like, the, you know, the building blocks for that? Thank you. 
Yeah, yeah I, um, we're, we're not breaking down Q2, 3, and 4 uh, at the line item at this point, Mauricio, so I can't really help you too much further than, than what we've done, other than to say, you know, expense hours being up uh, slightly here in the first quarter um, is really being driven by, you know, uh, two or three things. I think, you know, first off, we're continuing to lean into investing in, in technology, um, in customer experience initiatives uh, that were talked about at the Investor Day. I think the second piece that Martin referred to a, a moment ago, um, we are seeing some timing on marketing spend, principally at, the, at our dormy business, to grow the file and grow sales over the entirety of the year. Um, we will still have some level of merit pressure uh, across our, you know, 800 plus stores and, and distribution centers and 25,000 associates or more. So um, there are some uh, some level of merit pressures. So I think on a base of, you know, roughly 400 and in, in 50 million or so in in the prior year, um, you know, being up slightly, we think is managing the the business. Uh, pretty tightly um, in a difficult environment. So feel feel very good that the team is able to accomplish, you know, uh, an SGNA leverage point in that one to two percent range throughout uh, on an annual basis um, for, for the year. Got it. Thank you very much. Thanks. Okay. Thanks everyone. Appreciate the time today. Uh, have a great day. Thanks everybody. Thank you. We are now concluded. Again, thank you very much for your participation. Please disconnect.